Great to see you again. Great to see you in person <laughs> again, Tony. Now, I've been thinking a little bit about our past and I'm, I'm scratching my head trying to remember how long we've known one another. Yeah, I mean, sort of, it's strange that you would mention that, Tony, because uh, I was going through some old documents recently and uh, the Burke engagement contract popped up and it was back in 2011. 2011? Yeah, wow. we had the first contact and um, when we started work, we were, when you were a principal at Burke and Associates. I, I don't recall getting my uh, one decade uh, birthday card. <laughs> it must be in the mail. Yeah, it must be. It must, must be, be worried, But mail. time flies and, uh, and obviously you have been part of the journey from the very first, from the very beginning. To, I'm sure. pretty sure in Melbourne, you are the first, uh, Burke and Associates was one of the first practices. Is that right? approached us. Is that right? 2011. Well, it's, it's timely that we sit down and have a look back at where we've come from, what we've come to, and where we might be going. I have a vague recollection that you started off uh, studying at a university somewhere outside of Victoria. Remind me how that all came together. I came uh, to Australia in 96 and it was in Perth. So you might call I'm a Perth boy and that makes me a... Eagles fan in the footy, uh, being from Perth, uh, and uh, and I did my uni from the University of Notre Dame in uh, in Perth, uh, uh -huh. which is in uh, and uh, Catholic University with a tie up to the University of Notre Dame in the U.S. and then also went and did a masters from Curtin. And is Curtin also in Perth? It's also in Perth. You have yourself have had some quite a varied uh, <laughs> background, Tony. <laughs> yes. you have well, it's not me. quite as uh, structured as yours. I, no. I have to confess. No, I um, I went through school with the idea that I was going to do medicine when I mm -hmm. when I left, and uh, um, my father, late, late father thought that I really didn't understand what medicine was all about. So he arranged for a good friend of his who was a, an oncologist to take me on a tour following the oncologist around a cancer hospital for a couple of days. And uh, after seeing all the people dying of cancer, I decided I didn't want to do medicine. So I stumbled into law on the rebound pretty much. Um, found my way to Monash University where I did a couple of years and I hated it. <laughs> I really disliked the study of law, so I deferred and dropped out and, uh, um, and, and in the eyes of my parents, went to no good. I uh, got jobs as process worker in mm. factories. I mm. worked at the uh, Victorian Railways as a crane driver. Um, I worked at the Naval Dockyard at Williamstown as a paymaster and one thing led to another and I eventually went back to university through La Trobe University mm -hmm. where I did a, a liberal arts degree uh, and then finally found my way back to Monash and uh, finished off my law degree and then did some postgraduate studies in, in business management. So looking back on it now, um, I, I, I think I got my adventures out of my system reasonably early and settled down to a focus on law by the time I was about four or five years behind mm -hmm. most of my contemporaries. Once I got my head uh, over the piece of work and focused on the law, I, I did quite well. I've achieved a lot of things in my life in, in practice and um, um, I guess the highlight was when I was president of the Law Institute in Victoria in 2008 and that was a, a, a great year and uh, I, I learnt a lot and in fact uh, I'd like to think that our coming together a year or two later was in large part a product of my experience um, through the Law Society and travelling around the legal profession around the world and learning a lot about the new ways of doing things. We look back at around 2010 or 11 and how many and what well law firms doing at that time if you look back and and and, and in a post gfc environment a lot of firms had very little awareness about uh, leave aside outsourcing even the cloud platforms or uh, 
or, or what uh, innovation in the legal sector might look like through adaptive use of technology, etc. So at that time for you to have considered something like what uh, outsourcing would bring to the firm was very pioneering, obviously, because it's something that, that was not common at that time. There was a convergence of some really interesting things going on uh, at that time. There was something in the water. Uh, on the one hand, you had um, the internet expanding around the world very mm -hmm. rapidly, the cost of internet coming down very rapidly, um, the technology available in the legal profession increasing rapidly and so the the opportunity was there for someone like you to be entrepreneurial in the traditional way of bringing together these new and disparate ways in a new combination and creating an entirely new business model. And, and that's very right Tony that internet at a very basic level was the great enabler that uh, so long as you had good quality internet at a reasonable price you could log into any client system and remotely that's the backbone of doing work remotely now what we are finding in the middle of the COVID that all mm. of a sudden the importance of internet and uh, remote work we realized that back in 2010 at that time that if connectivity was available and in India uh, because of the population uh, internet is cheap it, it's not sophisticated as in it doesn't run under buildings mm. and you have your unique problems with internet running over houses and things like that the wires or fiber optics internet but getting fast internet is not difficult and even at that time and that's what enabled us to start the business uh, and 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 sort of realize that remote working is something that is possible your association with Calcutta and the history of the um, um, legal profession in Calcutta had a transformative effect that made things possible um, in ways that most people don't realise. And it would be interesting to hear you talk about that. No, absolutely, and that's something that even now I think is one of the most burning questions for a lot of new clients. That how can someone sitting in India or Calcutta know about the law in Australia mm. or, or know about the regulatory framework about ASIC or ASX or other things mm -hmm. that how is that possible they're not trained they don't go to school here they don't do a law degree here there's a big gap around understanding how that can happen mm -hmm. and, um, and and for us the decision to start in Calcutta was um, partly because both myself and my other Founder, uh, founding associate in SBA, were born and brought up in Calcutta. So mm -hmm. we sort of wanted to use and leverage the networks that we had in Calcutta to start operations. But also Calcutta ha has a very rich history. It's a city that is 300 years old. Yes. It's one of the first places where the British came when they colonized India. Mm -hmm. And that meant the legal system, the judicial system that grew over a hundred years from 1757 onwards, when the British first came, was very much modeled on the British system, the Westminster system mm. of law. And law was a way for the uh, British to colonize India because law brought something to India uh, that, that gave an opportunity to the middle class, for example, in, in Calcutta to go to universities and, uh, and be instructed in many instances in those times by a British professor because the British brought their professors, their lawmakers and their um, viceroys, what we call the governor generals, to administer India. So Calcutta was the capital of British India till 1911. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, the judicial system that has grown up, the universities that have flourished are all very much embedded in the British legal framework. So legal privilege, for example, uh, that is existent in India and in Calcutta in the dealings of lawyers and their clients in the same fashion as what we have here. Mm. But I often hear even now from prospective clients that do your team understand what is legal privilege. It's a very well established concept in India because of the regulatory framework of the British. 
and all the universities that have grown there many of them are over 200 years old because the british founded them so they have always instructed um, in english from the very onset and and if you went into law or in accounting that was a premier career so essentially you have a vast resource pool you have team members or prospective team members who have already got a law degree and knows about the British system of law very well, might have worked in an Australian outsourcing center, another or an American outsourcing center with international clients. And these are the resources who then come and work for us. So, and then they are at the benefit now of 10 years of experience of working with Australian clients, Australian regulatory framework. So the knowledge that has been built, as you mentioned, Tony, comes from Calcutta being a rich center of learning and history. Mm. And, and also what that means for the people who um, grew up there or when we grew up ourselves, that, that, that what sort of learning environment we had in there. Partha, one of the things that intrigues me in light of our discussions is, is the realisation that many of your team members in Calcutta are not dealing with just one legal service management system, but as many as 10. And, and that is uh, a level of expertise that is way beyond what you would find in most of the client firms here in Australia. Our footprint has grown over the 10 years where we were servicing clients in Victoria, Queensland, New South Wales, and you would know that the law looks different in each state in many areas of law. Mm. And every firm uses a different practice management system. I remember Burke was one of the first that used LEAP team also has to absorb knowledge around, uh, for example, Practice Evolved, File Pro, PC Law, Action Step, um, Smoke Ball. These are all the systems, the practice management systems, there's at least 15 or 20 that law firms use across the whole country. And our team has had the knowledge absorption of all of them. So training for us uh, means training in four, five, six different <laughs> yeah, practice six, management systems. Just extraordinary. And a lot of these guys who have worked with us for six, seven years, are really experts in, as you said, more than one practice management system, more than one area of law. For example, they're uh, providing convincing support in Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland. That people uh, mix that we have is quite unique in that sense that normally if you're working as a paralegal in an Australian firm locally, you would not get that opportunity to be exposed to so many different um, systems within the same practice. So we often come across clients where they're very good at what they do, obviously, and provide tremendous service to the client, mm. but their knowledge, in-house knowledge of the practice management software or the softwares they're using are not as good because they don't prioritize it or simply don't think it's important enough beyond the expertise of what they're doing. And that's changing, but, but that's where our team adds value because these are the guys who are knows the five different practice management systems already, the five different softwares, and, and that adds value to the practice because often is the in-house team asking our team, how do you use this or how do you use that? There must come a point where the uh, client firms are coming to you and saying, please do an audit of our system, please make a recommendation as to the best practice management software, please be active in the management of our um, our practice to, to achieve a better outcome. That must be coming. But often if a firm is looking at transitioning, for example, from one practice management system to another, it's very difficult for them to assess what the new software brings other than from the vendor. Because of the breadth of our clients, we can make connections with that firm with two or three or four different firms who are using the same software and, and have some know what's about uh, discussions around what has worked and what hasn't worked. Mm. And we also uh, share that experience. We are platform agnostic. How, how do you share it? Do you, do you run Zoom training sessions or Microsoft Teams sessions? How does it work? A, a lot of it is, uh, as you mentioned, that Zoom sessions or Teams sessions are also going into the practice and, and having a meeting and sitting down with the uh, stakeholders who are in charge of such a project mm. to sort of flesh through uh, what are they looking for in the new software.
there's a lot of talk of innovation in practices, but the biggest innovation inhibitor often is uh, practices not using their practice management <laughs> system and softwares exactly. well enough that you exactly. could create a lot of incremental innovation if you some, use the software. Some key person leaves and yeah. isn't replaced and the knowledge just goes out the door. Absolutely. There, there, there is a lot of uh, knowledge concentration in one or two key persons. For us, an engagement with us often has meant for firms that that knowledge that resides in those key person's head uh, comes out sometimes willingly, sometimes reluctantly into documented process flows, True. which articulates True. what that knowledge looks like and means that it's easier for the firm to train a new person when they come into the firm. We get a lot of senior partners uh, who um, are, are obviously uh, very focused on their area of expertise, mm. but do not simply have the time to uh, you know, learn the nitty gritty. The, the future will create a role for knowledge managers in many more legal firms than, than we've seen so far. And I've read legal futurists who've been predicting that as a key um, skill set of, of lawyers in the future. Documenting knowledge is not high on the priority often because everything is obviously very rightly focused on client service. So mm. anything that is what is deemed as a non-billing work um, is often gets pushed to True. the back end. True. But these are the processes which allow you to scale the practice a lot of the times. So often mm. the hindrance to scaling is because there's fantastic knowledge in people's head, but no one else knows how to do that. I think I'm right in saying that you are now of sufficient size as to be bigger than most of your client firm. You have a higher um, concentration of knowledge and legal management expertise within SBA than in most of the legal firms around the country. We say to most clients now that, that the engagement is not about outsourcing, as you mentioned. It's more than that. It's about that knowledge management. Mm. It's about creating processes within firms and, and scaling firms for, for growth and, and making uh, implementation of innovation easier within the firm. So that's really the value in the engagement instead of just looking at it as a, a resource play that you're getting someone in India to do the work instead of someone sitting here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's becoming much more sophisticated. Um, I, I wasn't aware that Calcutta was a major centre for, for outsourcing and you pointed out to me that much of the, um, the outsourcing from the United States and Australia and, and so on is directed to Bangalore, uh, which is now a major centre for the development of IT systems and the like. Definitely a lot of the traditional outsourcing that has grown is in Bangalore around IT and call centers, etc. But legal process outsourcing is, as you know, substantially different. It wasn't a matter of why we should be based in Bangalore or Calcutta, but where could you get the best legal resources, a vast resource pool to choose from, and good universities, and Calcutta has all of that. Forecasts as to the future of technology in the law? Our assessment of, of the various practices we are working with is that adoption of technology is still um, at an early stage in the sense that yes, yes. everyone is on the cloud, but, but it has taken probably a better part of 10 years for everyone to agree that, that we can have our software in the cloud. So the technology adoption amongst firms is is very mixed. The, the technology has a very big part to play in the service delivery in, in law firms, where it's about law firms also looking at um, then that what sort of people do we need to be working in our practice to make that happen? Is it just the lawyers or what does our support staff look like? Who, if, we, if they're engaging with us, what can we bring to the table to hasten the technology journey? by leveraging our knowledge. So there's a, there's a lot in the mix, there's a lot of opportunities. There's really, uh, I would dare say, a lot of talk about innovation, but in, in reality, innovation is, is often, we see the best in those firms who approach it incrementally and implement it instead of looking at large projects. How did SBA come to locate itself in Melbourne in the first place? You're a Perth boy. You were born and raised in Calcutta. Um, why Melbourne? 
the client growth that we experienced in Australia being focused on Australian firms mm. was obviously in Melbourne, in New South Wales and in Queensland. So it was quite an obvious and natural step for us to uh, be a, make Melbourne the centre of our operations and, and to give our clients comfort also that, that they have a, a local board that they can talk to and deal with in a local yeah, that, team. That That's was certainly important. a big, big factor in my decision. If you're engaging a team which sits 4,000 kilometres away, then uh, really you want a local presence in terms of uh, the decision makers, the board members of that team, because the reality of these, and, and that's especially true in the current COVID world, for example, where we have travel restrictions, that you cannot jump on a plane and go and chase someone if something went wrong in an engagement, for example. So <laughs> having the local right. accountability and, uh, and legal resource on risk management viewpoint, we, we thought that having the presence in Melbourne and our board being presence locally uh, gave us a lot more governance credibility at an early stage, even in 2010-11, than um, you know, an outsourcing entity that is based in India or Philippines might offer the services at a cheaper rate but has no local uh, knowledge or a lot of the time we see that um, they might appoint someone local but that person is not in any ways associated or embedded into the company where mm. whereas we have lived and breathed as we are from day one we started and founded the company we, yes. we have uh, sort of understand what local firms want in terms of accountability locally and, and at the same time enjoy the benefits of being able to use the way team in India. For any firm looking at outsourcing mm. or engaging an external team that, that having uh, the local accountability and for us that has grown obviously uh, into meaning that now we have also a local Melbourne team that a lot of firms yes. uses yes. and you would know as uh, being on the board of uh, SLS, Strategic Legal Solutions, yes. which has come about because we found that um, many of our clients uh, wanted the leverage of having both a local team they could access flexibly in addition to the uh, India team um, that services them and, and so demand has grown for that, that the flexible access to expertise flexibly uh, without incrementally increasing headcount in-house. And yeah. I think COVID has only incre enhanced and sort of that need even further. Looking at SBA, um, you've changed shape in multiple ways in the, the course of the, the 10 years you've been here in, in Melbourne. Um, do you see any, any uh, future changes? more use of artificial intelligence in various processes, For sure. more use of automation software. So how are services... On the, on the artificial intelligence issue, is there any, any work in prospect there? Our team is currently uses AI in various processes. AI is still at a stage in our assessment, Tony, where it requires significant knowledge investment within firms to implement AI, and mm. you need to have scope and scale of project to get the benefits from it. It's, it's not... Uh, an off-the-shelf product yet to the extent that firms can easily use it. It's getting better. It's like, you know, the first car AI's journey is like that. But for example, within our processes, our uh, word processing team currently uses AI for dictations and that still yes, produces... Yes, I read that. That's extraordinary. Yeah. The use of AI in those sort of processes is only increasing. Uh, it, it must be easy to use. It must be um, for lack of a better word, idiot proof to implement. If it's too complex, mm -hmm. the practical uh, use of AI is based on what's easy to use and what can you quickly implement. And that will grow over the next 10 years. And we are certain of that evolution, Tony. We don't know what it will look like, to be honest, over the next 10 years, but we are prepared for it because the things won't be anything like what it looks like today. I can remember being at an International Bar Association conference in Buenos Aires in Argentina about 12 years ago and there was a lecture by uh, a senior lawyer from Adelaide talking about his firm's role in data mining but as he spoke to this uh, audience of about 200 people little by little the lawyers stood up and walked out of the room so that by the end of the hour of the presentation, there were only about 10 of us left there listening to what he had to say. 
uh, scratching their heads and at a loss to understand how artificial intelligence could be applied in law. But it's when it's all said and done, what we're doing is uh, analysing data and and um, um, that, that can be commodified. And what you mentioned about the Buenos Aires example, that, that the real opportunity for practices is the data that they have within their practice management systems, mm. but the real gap is very few practices have a business analyst. If you're not a very large practice mm. um, or a, a national practice where you have those sort of teams in there, if you're a, a medium to smaller niche practice, the reality is you don't have a business analyst in your team or a, or a Microsoft BI expert, for example. So there is a gold mine of data that you have within your practice management system, but how you're utilizing it, the inhibitors are around those resources and knowledge of the tools. And that's the real uh, opportunity and challenge for a lot of firms, that they have a lot of data uh, sitting in Leap, sitting in Smokeball, sitting in Action Step, but uh, there is no connectivity of that data easily with something like Microsoft Business Intelligence or any of the other tools which allow you to mine that data effectively and, and create and, and see what your clients are doing. Yes. If you are a small and medium practice especially. We do a lot of work transferring data from one practice management system into another. But in this day and age where having cross integration between softwares is common in most other industries, in the legal industry it is not. Firms are very much inhibited by what they can do with the data inside the practice management system. So there needs to be a push, we feel, to make the software builders or the practice management systems um, more responsible for making their data talk to other data quite easily. Mm. Um, and, and, and that will enable firms to use that data also a lot easier. I, th I think uh, firms that are ambitious on the technological front and that have embraced SBA um, survived the impact of COVID much better than those who did not. Have you had an increase or an uptick in inquiries from other law firms who've been confronted by their inability to adjust to working remotely? Quite a mix there, Tony, since the start of COVID, obviously, because of what our conversation or discussion around firms finding it hard to visualise how can someone in India know how to do the work. Another visualization problem for firms around remote work before COVID has always been, how can someone remotely access our systems? So when COVID hit for many practices, definitely was a forced technology upgrade. And in many instances, we also found that firms were forced to have people in the office because their systems were simply not um, uh, robust enough to enable work mm. from home. Uh, that has meant definitely more inquiries for us around what uh, we can bring and, and, and more uh, conceptualization and visualization by practices that if, if my team can remote work now because of COVID, then uh, w what does resource use look like for my practice if I use Team SBA? I've been amazed at the adaptability of my own firm through the COVID crisis. Uh, it's almost as if they didn't skip a beat. Yeah. It just rolled on and rolled on. And um, and then I received an email the other day telling me that paper-based files don't exist anymore. So it's all, it's, it's, it's all moving in a direction of uh, um, disaggregated practitioners working in multiple locations at flexible times and, and being able to... Uh, speak to their colleagues in Calcutta and elsewhere whenever the need arises. It's fantastic. A lot of the time that transition is about uh, training teams also. There's a tendency in a yes, lot of practices yes. that I cannot live without printing a hundred things. So unless team members are trained to work differently, uh, like many we have found during COVID many practices um, in terms of usage of dual screen to look at information if you don't, mm. if you cannot print. It's not something that everyone easily picks up. You have to train your team members. If, if team members are working from home, you have to give them a level of 
active IT support because not everyone is um, IT savvy to the same extent, obviously, to do the work. So there's all those things in that remote working environment which makes it easier and better. And, that, and that's been tough for many firms, definitely. But coming back to where it is now, yes, firms do have a better realization at least now that that remote working is a real live viable option as a part and of the research. we will never go back to doing things the old way it won't be economic to do things the old way and uh, um, i think insurers and uh, and other risk people have come to to terms with the idea of that it used to be that a law firm was a single homogenous being but now it's morphing into something that is a loose aggregation of people with a variety of skills coming together on a project by project basis um, as the market requires. That's happened or happening partly out of necessity and because of what COVID has created around the necessity for remote work, the necessity for uh, not having everything centralized and, law, and 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 being able to interact with your clients differently uh, and and making the clients comfortable around that also mm. and and part of that is also firms then going back to our previous discussion bringing in people within practices who can enable them um, that that having the the technology people or having the knowledge people who can come in and and look at the processes and and transform them effectively uh, because it's very easy to say to the team members, you're not going to use paper anymore, but what, what is done to enable uh, them to do that? What sort of training has, for example, gone in to enable them to do that? So that, that's really the transformation piece, which is easy and which is hard for a lot of practices. Uh, SBA is a knowledge bank uh, that is underutilized by its um, clients and law firms that don't recognise that and don't avail themselves of that opportunity will be throwing good money out the door. With um, advances in technology, there will be um, ever more flexible ways of conducting legal practice and that uh, astute practitioners would be foolish um, to try to uh, um, invent for themselves the best ways of running a practice and they should be coming to people who are in the middle of all of the middle of the, the freeway traffic uh, and encountering uh, 10 or so practice management systems and um, paying for the advice about what's best to use. We are uh, uh, often like an ordinary business doing being privileged to be doing extraordinary things Yes, in the sense that we, we we don't go out and um, advertise as much about all the you should. All, all, all these benefits of um, of being at the confluence point as you said of practice management systems mm. knowledge management systems and, and having the privilege of being of dealing with 60 or 70 firms of different states different size shape um, culture and um, and areas of practice and 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 bringing all that together for, for, for the real competitive advantage still of the new clients who are coming on board at the moment are they can benefit from the 10 years experience and, and the confluence of all of that, that that pioneers like yourself, for example, from day one has, mm. has beaten the path to create. But it, it's still, if you look at the number of firms who um, are exploring um, outsourcing or exploring innovation um, uh, in in terms of uh, different ways of doing things is it, it, still in the minority in our view and there are tremendous opportunities for firms to um, sort of evolve or uh, uh, utilizing COVID as a catalyst definitely uh, to better serve their clients through better processes, better engagement by having leveraging some of what we do um, and and and, and and evolving that way. Uh, I was an advocate of um, moving work off to SBA, but uh, two of my fellow lawyers were apprehensive about yeah. um, 
the situation and concerned there might be some um, inappropriate employment practices going on. So we paid for them to jump on a plane and go over to Calcutta. And I think they were there for a week or so and came back glowing in their comments about the working conditions and the work environment. But more to the point, the very fact that they had been there meant that they had immersed themselves in what was possible. They came back with a much better and much more evolved idea of the potential of SBA than if we had just started uh, as, as a virgin client here in Melbourne. And so we got off to a flying start. We still remember that visit and, and that was one of the first visits that we had once mm. again from any client. And, and it's, it's a great experience it was for the partners and for the team because as you said that a lot of the notions around what does the work environment look like, who are these people who are doing our work, um, how can we train them effectively, but, but it was a wonderful experience and since then... Well, I look forward to going there myself one of these days. Yes, once we are all allowed to travel again, Tony, yeah. and, and, and many clients after that has also gone and it's, it's about what you said, Tony, very relevant there that, that that if the firm invests in the relationship and, and, and has and takes hold of it, it, they can take it much further. And we have really found that firms like Bergen Associates uh, and other firms who have done that mm. has got the real benefit out of, out of the engagement because you need to drive it in-house also to be able to gather the maximum benefit. And, mm. and, and in your case, it meant jumping on a plane, sending to all the partners across for other firms, it might mean having the culture that when you have a new team member coming in, making them aware that uh, the firm uses, uh, have an external team, the way team. Right. And, and a lot of the time, uh, that learning experience for the new team member is then direct from our team, instead of having an induction, for example, where yeah. they're made, whereas there are other practices where in, like yourself at Burke and, and other, clients that you're dealing with where the way team is embedded into the practice. Mm. So when a new team member joins, they are told about the way team, what to expect and how to send work and all of that. So, mm. so, so that's a very important part of really getting the benefit, getting the knowledge and asking um, what more can the team do? Well, Pather, it's been 10 years and we've learned a lot. I've learned a lot and uh, uh, you've grown and prospered and and the business is going great guns I believe um, so thank you to you and all at SBA for what you've um, done for us over the last 10 years and I look forward to the next thank you Tony it has been the journey has been made easier because of uh, pioneers like yourself who started with us and now you're part of SBA as a part of SLS and it's really our privilege and and and, and really um, once again, it, it's, it's the very few like you who have made the journey possible and the journey easier because you're a step ahead of or, or the leader of the pack and, and then they say that the real benefit for a lot of the newer clients who are coming now is learning from your experience, for <laughs> you're example, very kind. and what you have done. So uh, we look forward to the next 10 years, Tony, and, and what that brings. But if it's anything like the last 10 uh, we know that there will be a lot of uh, more interesting conversations. Sure, I look forward to that. Thank you, Tom. All the best.